welcome this evening to this very special event under the, our series, The Art Matters. The welcome is on behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India International Center. And as you could have read it, this is the 58th in the series. So we have been at it for more than five years discussing and imprinting upon people that arts matter. Uh, today is a special day because it is a Vishwakarma day, <laughs> uh, which of course I wouldn't have known until I was a story a short while ago. Um, my racial memory, like yours, has dimmed. Uh, and it has a special significance because Meera Mukherjee, wrote a book called In Search of Vishwakarma and the artisans with whom she worked used to call her Vishwakarma ki beti. So there is a kind of a resonance of that today. Uh, this has happened accidentally but many accidents are much better than planned events. Uh, we have two persons who are going to discuss the life and vision of Meera Mukherjee, who was a major sculptor. I met him uh, had once in Bhopal, when she had come to Bharat Bhavan. And we had a special fascination because she was also working with the tribal artist of Bastar. And she was using the technique of uh, the wax removal. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in her uh, sculpture. Uh, so there is a, the two persons who are going to talk, is one Dr. George Lechner, who seemed to have <coughs> been uh, someone whom all of us have known for many years as director and a lover of Indian arts and culture, a director of Max Muller Bhavan, uh, not only in Delhi, but in Calcutta, in Bombay, all over the place. And in Munich. And Munich. The whole world. Yes. Uh, he, uh, he, um, he was particularly uh, interested, and in, through his initiatives, many important uh, events took place in collaboration or directly by Max Muller Bhavan, wherever he was. Uh, he said, bit of a troublemaker like me, that wherever we are, we do pick up some trouble. Anyway, that's what it is. Uh, Dr. Leshner is here, and uh, we have met after many years, although we briefly met at Paris recently. Dr. Geeti Sain, uh, those who come to IIC, is not he is an art historian, an art critic, has written on Raza and Ganesh Pine. She was the editor for many years of the IIC quarterly and uh, she had of course visited and lectured all over the place. Uh, when they, all over the place I mean the globe rather than merely India. So they are going to talk but before uh, they talk and I suggest that they talk for 25 minutes each. So that would be uh, uh, fine. No? You suggest. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we have a film to see at the end. Before uh, the, con I mean, the talks I'm start, uh, we, may, may I request Abhijit Lach, Bipin Shah, and Rina Lach to join us for the book launch. Uh, the book is called Purity of Vision. It is published by many, too many publishers, as you see, but basically by map, mapping. And we have also provided some assistance. Uh, Aka Prakar. So there you are. We and first Imamiya. launched the book. And Imamiya. Art. Huh? And Imamiya. Imamiya. And Imamiya. Yeah, that's right. Far too many people are involved. <laughs> so each one cannot be named. <laughs> So, we so there, please join us. 
some there, we some stand. here. We stand. We stand, yeah. We stand. So I'm going to pass on the book so each of you have one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, this is unveiled already. Well done, it's already done. Okay. <laughs> Untying <laughs> itself. Untying. No, the unveiling. Okay, here it goes. There's no unveiling. We have to unveil no unveiling, it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. All the pictures have been taken. Oh, Everybody sorry, has I'm seen. Moving. <laughs> Some of you may about buy and read it also. Yeah. <laughs> it is a well designed book. That's what it is meant for. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, I must also especially name Rina and Abhijit Love first, but I'm not going now into an exercise, an academic exercise of something he has missed out on, not mentioning this one and that one. I don't do that, but I have the pleasure also to welcome uh, a representative of the Max Miller Pavan that I used to have. Thomas Myers here. So, but to go into the other names would take up uh, the better part of, uh, well, and so on. So I, I skip it, but just like that, but in my heart I skip nothing. I take you all in and I love you all, you know. And it's lovely to be with you again. PT included, of course. <laughs> so, I just, I have written it down for the simple reason that I meant it to be a tribute to my friend Mira Mukherjee and not uh, exposed to an imagination of a moment that I have reflected on it and I hope you take it as a reflected kind of uh, conversation with Mira and we are there for her to honor her memory. I'm so happy you do it with us. So, um, let me first uh, explain the angle from which I look at Mira Mukherjee. Yeah. You tell me if it is not well adjusted, the mic, then I adjust my mouth. <laughs> Professionally speaking, I have been a cultural mediator in the service of the Goethe Institute, known as Max Miller Bhavan here in India for good reasons, by the way, over some 30 years, 40 years. And this is how my focus will be on Mira's connection with Germany, the part I personally played, the modest part I played in making her art known in India and in Germany, on my own aesthetic and philosophical assessment of her art and my personal friendship with her. I'm basically speaking of a period spanning my Indian years um, from 66 to 86. And again, the time from 2012 to today. This connection blots out her years of formation, of course. Her fieldwork in rural India, her manifold activities in suburban Calcutta with children and uh, her work with uh, kanta making, as well as her paintings and drawings that are very important also. And no comparison, uh, no comparative look on contemporary sculptors either. Well, I've defined my talk, and, uh, but my talk does include, it does include common friends, above all, Mirma Chingupta. If I were to give uh, a title to the first uh, part of my talk, I would name it Three Exhibitions, simply, Three Exhibitions. Because everything else is prelude, interlude and postlude. I first met Mira in early 66, immediately after taking over as Max Miraban uh, director in Kolkata. She had been employed by my German colleagues there as an assistant help in the library, her German being still reasonably good after her years of formation 
at the Munich Art Academy, Kunst Academy, um, in the 50s, from 54 to 57, roughly. As usual, even then, she was short of money and unable to pursue her work <coughs> with the rather expensive bronze sculptures. Uh, and she used to need raw material regularly, given her creativity. So um, she was therefore glad to be on our payroll for uh, some while. And that day she came out, I remember very well, of a corner of our library in Kolkata um, with a, an air of amused curiosity. Um, who is that guy, sort of? Even after a short exchange of uh, pleasantries, we found ourselves in the middle of a hot argument and promised to settle the issue in the days to come. We soon discovered that we had more to exchange than hot arguments and I became a regular visitor to her modest home and the, early, and the wonderful but also modest courtyard below her flat where notwithstanding the narrowness of that space she found a place for even big sculptures like Ashoka. As if by some miracle, the flat and the courtyard had to retreat and give way to the sublime. When in 1917 I was transferred to New Delhi, in spite of all those bund and grau written years, I felt homesick of Calcutta, and my first impulse was to carry with me as many of my cherished memories of my years in Calcutta as possible. This way I organized that very year the first complete retrospective of films by none other than Shatajid Rai, 15 by the way at that time, later on it was over 40 at the end, at the Sapru house and uh, of all available sculptures by Mira Mukherjee at IFAX still exists, <laughs> with the personal presence of the two protagonists, uh, of course, in Delhi. Going back to this proposed title of mine, this was the first of the three exhibitions. Every single one of Mira's exhibits was sold. <coughs> one of the buyers being Josef Hermann Abs, the famed president of the Deutsche Bank at the time, and to this day everybody knows his name. And he was interested in a sculpture, and I didn't dissuade him exactly, and so he bought it. And um, Mira consulted me each time to decide the price, and was happy to go back to Calcutta with a sizable amount, I can assure you, at the time. But uh, <coughs> As was the case with any such income of Mira, she immediately thought of a sculpture to invest in. She never kept even a rupee to herself. Immediately she invested in work, or in raw material, bronze. But then she had a momentous dream. Mira was a very psychic person, if you like. She had visions and dreams all the time. Well, purity of fashion, yeah. Um, and the, in that dream she was told to create a large figure of Emperor Ashoka, initiator of the Ashoka pillars, as we know, preaching Buddhism and non-violence after the, his, Ashoka's cruel wars, and especially after the battle of at Kalinga. And uh, Mira's powerful sculpture here, to be seen in the garden of the Moria Hotel in New Delhi. Please go there and see it, and see it for a long time. Shows the emperor with the sword in the right hand and the peaceful hand um, in the 
reminiscent, of course, of the Indian tradition, perhaps of Atta Maheshwara, the, uh, the right, the left, uh, peaceful hand, uh, reminding of, uh, rem rem reminding us of the peace. And that dream predicted that she would die after completing the uh, huge sculpture. She didn't at the time. But she did all, the, she did after almost completing another huge sculpture, a seated Buddha. Any coincidence? The large Ashoka statue was in for a difficult life, if you like. Lying idle in different spaces, easily too small for a large work like this, being sold and resold to find its long-time home in the garden of the Moria Hotel here, on the road to the airport, as if to pull back all those swift and mobile passengers, inviting them to moments of rest and meditation. Years pass, and I find myself posted to Bombay, where I join hands with my French friend and colleague, Yves Begbeder, former colleague of the Alliance Française in Calcutta, and now my colleague in Bombay, and an admirer of Mira, like myself. He also had three sculptures to this day. I saw them the other month in Paris. The costs at the time were very heavy, but we managed to assemble together the two institutions um, another complete retrospective of her works for an exhibition at the Jahangir Art Gallery. In 83, that was. Special lorries had to be hired to carry the earth carriers, another huge statue, a sculpture, to, this, to, to Mumbai. And Mira had created the couple as an homage to the laborers of the Calcutta Metro uh, construction. The market situation at the, of the day had it that only one of the two carriers was sold. It was meant to be a couple, and is meant to be a couple, and for the other to remain solitary and to land up in Bangalore for some time. Uh, the lonely other part uh, could, be, find, could find a home in Calcutta at the Mita house in Calcutta, you can see it now. And I have a promise from the owner, the collector of that lady couple, the lady part of the couple, to do everything to bring the man, the other part of the couple, back to Calcutta. Uh, to Calcutta. I am sure he will keep his promise. I'm absolutely sure. Uh, at the time, Pilu Pochkanavala, a fellow artist from Bombay, you know, accompanied the exhibition with enthusiasm and became an even closer friend of Mira in the years to come. Again, Mira consults me on the, on the price of every single piece, and we decide together. In this second exhibition, in my count, most of the exhibits are sold. Uh, some, however, remain among them, one earth carrier, as I told you. But Mira's work gets a new boost. Uh, she's again invited to Germany and um, can hold yeah, three solo exhibitions in Calcutta over the next 10 years. So, again years pass. Mira leaves us in 1998. I go into retirement in 2000-2001 and on comes a surprising new friendship. Rina and Obijit Lad, the young couple looking after the Prakar Art Gallery in Calcutta, and enamored with Mira's art even without ever having met her. They could have. In the wake of the German festival in India, round about that time, uh, which I could initiate with great difficulty, by the way, but it did happen, and ten years later a second one happened here in India. 
and in connection with my activities as a board member of the Indian Institute in Munich, that exists, Indian Institute München in German, I could organize a third retrospective, that's exhibition number three, uh, of Mira's bronze sculptures at the Buchheim Museum in uh, 2012. This museum is one of the two German museums focusing on German expressionism, situated outside of Munich at the Starnberg Lake, very beautiful place, near the erstwhile place of studies of Mira at the Munich Academy. I'm sure she was there many times. The exhibition is in association with Akka Brakar and in cooperation of the Indian Institute, which I was in the directorate at the time. It proved very successful, I must say, and you are witness to that, and uh, with a host of accompanying uh, cultural events over a month or so. Uh, we had come round a full circle, and this time the project of a standard book on Mira and her art was born. Again, sponsors came and went over the next years, but the book has, as is in spite of all the birth pangs, seen the light of the day, or the light of, yeah, the neon light. And um, with the first idea of it having been born in the mists of Steinberg Lake. And from the beginning, Marina and Abhijit Lat had been really masterminding the book as a labor of love. Now, this was what I could do in my professional activity. And let me now, in part two, say a few words, not, well, a few words, um, about uh, her time in Germany, and uh, then also her position uh, outside of this context. Um, in the world of bronze sculpture in general. Now, Tony Stadler, Tony Stadler was at Mira's time, his uh, teacher, vice president of the Munich Art Academy, and he was at the height of his creativity, and invited to the famed international art event Documenta in Kassel, the second one it was, in 1959, it was, right. He had an inclination towards Buddhism, Tony Stadler, and he had by himself acquainted himself with the lost wax bronze cut casting technique, the technique favored by uh, Mira, and uh, the technique he was to study in rural India, as was mentioned um, earlier. The influence of Tony Stadler on Mira's artistic development may be classified as a more indirect, rather direct one. Although it is true that Mira's artistic inclinations had well been served by the expressive character of his art and the German art of this period, Expressionism, is a German intuition, I think, um, and you know German Expressionism probably because of the names in painting like uh, Nolde and schmidt rotluff and Kirchner and Mark and Kandinsky. These names are familiar to you. But looking back to Tony Stadler, this artist was, in spite of all outer success, more and more ridden by self-doubt and probing questions, nagging, at his belief in the perfect, so-called perfect, piece of art. The German right, uh, art critic, um, colleague of yours, Werner Haftmann, even went as far as speaking of a, quote, chain of voluntarily accepted defeats without his creative life, unquote. The connection to Mira Mukherjee is twofold. Firstly, the self-doubt was also the permanent companion uh, of Mira's creative process. I remember many an occasion when I was witness to her never-ending questioning of a given form, her willingness to accept critical comments, 
to bring about changes, only to come somewhat nearer to her final vision of her sculpture. There were even moments before the opening of an exhibition when she was so self-critical of her work that she was inclined to give them away for free, should anybody care. Yeah, I really can vouch for that. Her quiet and unassuming manners, her shyness, are reminders of her German teacher, and not her least tribute to him. And then, of course, secondly, there is the Asian idea of perfection to be gained only through a never-ending journey, the Tao being the goal and destination itself. In East Asia, for instance, and I know what I say, I've been close to people from East Asia, drawing a horse or a bamboo or cherry blossoms or a misty landscape have always been standard exercises. Goethe had promised in his drama Faust redemption for those who were engaged in such a never-ending effort. In German, famous. Wer immer strebend sich bemüht, den können wir lösen. And the contemporary, the most important in my opinion, contemporary German philosopher Peter Sotterberg calls for being as repeating and rehearsing. In German, das übende Dasein. Being as repeating and rehearsing. Mira sometimes called it the artist's prayer because his or her work takes on an almost religious dimension at, on this level. And again, in Mira's own parlance, and with that inimitable touch of the Indian intuition about the self and the universe, the Atman and the Brahman being Advaita, being inseparably, inseparable, she said, quote, Mira, like an artisan, an artist must learn to work with ease, without ease. Through work, one after another of the barriers with him fall apart, until nothing remains to separate his inner self from the greater beyond, and the great power of the universe is within grasp of his own creative self. Now Mira, in her healthy appetite for human emotions and feelings in their direct and raw state, not distanced by any heroic and religious attitudes, very often chose, as we know, to represent movement, joy, suffering, compassion, laughter and tears of everyday life in her art. With Mira you will usually not come across those idealized Hindu deities and myths with all their multiple iconographic attributes, Radha and Krishna and Vishnu and Brahman, Rama, Sita, Anuman, Lakshmi, um, where she does take up a mythological figure, she transforms them. Durga does not uh, have multiple hands that carry weapons, but these hands carry plants and flowers. Or um, Shiva uh, becomes a wildly dancing bowl. And uh, Buddha awakes from deep meditation to confront the world. You will see the images, I'll show them to you. Her art portrays rather the endless patience of women and I know why I pick out this example, you will see that too. The crowd closing in one, on one another in the drizzling rain, women repairing the fishermen's nets, the lily gatherer, the man in the bicycle, the widowing girl, the cablemen, the beggar's empty bowl, the innocence of the children, the devotion of the pilgrims, and the affection of mother and child. Her themes are not to be found in the Vedas, but around the corner. In the life of the common people, the toddy tapper, the rickshaw the hammer man, the workshop under a tree, 
but also the queues at the passport office or the urban disaster. Those are titles of sculptures of hers. As many subjects, as many sculptures. And most of them in the best tradition of German expressionism, all full of empathy, soulful. And I suggest to you, please look at Mira again and her work from the angle of German expressionism, without perhaps her knowing it. She was an Indian artist of expressionism. I think this has not been fully understood yet. But you are there to spread the message. Now, then amongst all those hundreds, hundreds, many hundreds of, of small or medium-sized bronze figures, Mira occasionally also wants to point to the extraordinary, even the grand and sublime, sublime in human existence. And it is then that she brushes aside all considerations of time, energy, cost of material, or size and reaches out into superhuman dimensions. Then she creates those deliberately oversized sculptures, the gigantic Ashoka, of course, involving tons of molten bronze and so on, months of casting and welding, her moving, for me, very moving earth carriers, as her homage to the labors of Calcutta Metro construction, her huge two bowls that you can find in front of the Rabindra Shadan in Calcutta, not being well looked after by people there, but they're there for you to admire. And the most impressive seated Buddha in, if you like, in the position of larger than size, uh, larger than life representation of the standing seated and reclining Buddha. In her art, both aspects, the events of everyday life and the grand aspirations of the great souls are but the two sides of the same coin. Here is what Mira said on the subject, quote, I served a period of apprenticeship under the Bastar artisans, working with these superb craftsmen. I could not suppress a thrill to feel that the great Tanjo bronze made by fingers such as theirs, and I was in their company. I as I saw their dedicated effort with which they built holy images which men will revere and worship, I asked myself, can we artists, modern artists, not approach the work that we do in the same spirit? What if we, building the figure not of a god, but of more earthly things, can we not feel in such creation spiritual unfolding? And at some other time she wrote, quote, I work on two principles, one in celebration of humanism and two as yearning for reaching out beyond the quotidian. Since almost five decades now, her bronze figure, seated woman, you have, Kiki, you have said it was also thought streams. I don't know whether Mira gave that title. Did Mira give that title? Yeah, then I accepted it. <laughs> because people give titles afterwards. And uh, well, for me, she's seated woman, but thought streams is beautiful also. Um, she, this woman has been my constant companion in changing homes and different com continents. The throbbing rhythm of her dress and body lines, the elongated neck, and the slight tilt towards the right, symbolizing the tensions of the waiting attitude, contrast beautifully with the peace and patience of her face and her posture, an inspiration enough for a lifetime, I assure you. 
And then there will be forever, of course, a lasting homage to the warm bonding and dignity of labor of the earth carriers, the overwhelming and monumental Ashoka, wherever it will stand finally on Indian soil. Over the years, the image of the enlightened Buddha had turned out to be the noblest challenge for the sculptress. Mira died while working on her last Buddha image in search of her own redemption and enlightenment as an artist. And to finish, I would just show you some 17 short slides so that it becomes a visual exercise and not just a verbal one. Um, Greek mythological figure. And um, it's still to be seen in Munich in a public place, that very sculpture. The figure is not static, as you can see, but in the middle of a movement, like so many of Mira's sculptures. So this was her teacher, Tony Stadler. The next. Yeah. This is a sculpture by the German sculptor Ernst Barlach. It's called The Singing Man, Der Singende Mann. And next. Der Lachende Alte, The Laughing Old Man, by the same uh, sculptor. Now, you should know that during Mira's Munich uh, years, in the 50s, three sculptors held the attention, uh, public attention in Europe. That was Auguste Rodin, yes, uh, yes. Henry Moore of England, and Ernst Barlach of Germany. Mira met and spoke to Henry Moore in England, there are many photos of that meeting, but was not directly influenced by any of those. She was herself. Indirectly, though, I propose, by the highly expressive character of Ernst Barlach's works. We just saw the two examples, the singing and the laughing one. Thank you. Next. Well, this is, of course, the famous self-portrait of Albrecht Dürer in the year 1500. Then, as now, at display at the Munich Museum Alte Pinakothek, just round the corner of Mira's study place, and um, I'm sure the target of her numerous visits there. So she saw this many times while she was in Munich, the original, of course. Now, in this portrait, Albrecht Dürer not only proves a master drawer and painter of an individual person, in this case his own person, but also succeeds in reminding us of his idealized identity as Christ the Savior. Now, the embodiment of the individual person and the spiritual symbol in one and the same work of art is a cornerstone in European art. I, I add, for instance, in that tradition, European tradition, Mona Lisa is, of course, the external symbol of womanhood, and, uh, but also an identifiable contemporary of Da Vinci. And the research has identified her as a particular person of that time. So the two combine in one. Dürer, the man of Nürnberg and so on, and Dürer, the Christ, as it were. And of course, you know that in this tradition, to be complete, God has to be born as an individual human being, as a Jew named Jesus Christ. So this is um, what I have to say about this. And the next one is another illustration in a way of the same phenomenon. Um, now we have 
this is, yeah, the famous, uh, of course, Buddha in meditation, deep meditation, and with the blessing hand and so on and so on. Now the next one. When Mira did the Buddha, he has his eyes wide open. and goes into a dialogue with the world and touches the ground and is not just in meditation but is alert. And now let me, so she brings him to the world again, out of meditation, wakes him up and say, come on, this is the time to act. Now the next and this is, again, the last example for the same phenomenon, in a way, on the left you have a 12th century symbol of the crucified Christ. And on the right you have the same um, Christ um, who, is, who becomes the victim of the horrors of the Second World War, because that sculpture was uh, the work of an artist created in 45, a few months after the war. And you see the torture he undergoes, uh, symbolizing the horrors of the war. And this can also be seen in a monastery in Salzburg still. So, the next one. Now this is of course the classical Chola bronze uh, of the Nadaraj. Um, with all the ingredients, uh, the multiple arms and the feet and the f f flame circle and so on and so on. And when, next, when Mira does her cosmic dancer, she keeps the elements of the iconography like multiple arms and so on and the flame surrounding the circle, but turns them into a vibrating and dancing bowl-like uh, figure fighting the elements. Then, next. Now, some years later, in an exhibition held in Munich, uh, six years ago exactly, under the title, beautiful title, Enduring Legacy, that is about contemporary Bengali art. Um, Devanjan Roy, the author of this uh, sculpture, shows his version of Shivanataraj, this time under the guise of poet Rabindranath Tagore. The basic structure of four arms and lifted foot intact, but with a circle of flames transmuted into the fire of the Bengali alphabet. The whirling of the hair tamed under a cap. A smartphone at the ears and no longer in bronze, but in painted fi fiberglass, cast on wooden pedestal, and his foot not crushing the dwarf, symbol of ignorance, but resting on the globe. Next. Now, um, the next... Uh, let me see whether we have... This is a picture by Shilvanti, a uh, bust of Shilvanti Bracht, that is, uh, was in Germany for a long time. That was the first bust that Mira made in Munich. Toni Stadler asked her, now the exercise of the term at the university is to make a bust. And uh, Mira said, uh, oh, who, who will be my model? And Shilvanti was there as a fellow student, and she said, take me as a model. And they have become great friends, and this is the uh, bust. Beautiful, I think, isn't it? Yeah, next. Yeah, these are now, just to finish, a few uh, visuals from Mira's works in German possession. If I am not mistaken, German collectors have the greatest number of smaller or not so small pieces of Mira. Or am I wrong or right? Partly, who who is? Who which countries? No. I think Germany has the most. Yes. Yeah, so I'm 
Right, thank you for Mira. <laughs> um, then next, this is the cat. And this is the biggest piece in Germany, a tribal girl. It's in Nuremberg, and it's in private collection. You can't easily see it, unfortunately. I can, but you can't. <laughs> and I, I love it, that girl. She has all the ingredients of the walk of an Indian lady. And when Chandra Leka always t told me, look, Georg, I love to come to your country, but can you spare me the sight of your women? I said, why? They are so beautiful. Yeah, but the way they walk, <laughs> it's always from A to B, and the rest is nothing. But with an Indian lady, you never know. Do they start out, or do they arrive? Or do they don't, don't they walk, but just, you know, it's so beautiful. This is the tribal girl with all the balance of the elegance of an Indian girl walking. Well, that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next. Yeah, I'm living with this wonderful Paul dancer every day of my life also. Like a woman, I have a man and a woman that are my couple, my daily couple. Yeah, next. Yeah, and then, of course, I end with Ashoka in the courtyard underneath the flat of Mira in Calcutta. And you see how the space becomes big when Ashoka is there. And now and then, the next one is, of course, Ashoka as seen. Next is as seen in the Moria Gardens, uh, Moria Hotel Gardens, and now, next one. This is this lady I'm with for the last 50 years, seated woman, or uh, thoughts, stream of thoughts. She has been my daily companion, and I shall not part with her nor with Mira ever. Thank you. Glasses. Thank you. Look at that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ashok and the Raza Foundation for having me here. Uh, Ashok Vajpai and the Raza Foundation for having me here. I'm very privileged to be here because I think that it is probably the most uh, important. I'd like to thank them because they have actually resurrected Mila Mukherjee, who passed away in 98, which is now 20 years, and she's been much forgotten. So I think this is one of the most important moments to bring her back. And my talk is going to be very brief, a very uh, an introduction. Thank you, Dr. Lechner, for a very personal and very thorough and intense uh, examination and of relating Mira's work to the Western tradition as well. And there were some very similar things we, we just met, and we're talking about some no, images that, that we share. Just met. And, I mean, they're going to, so I'm okay, going to go. repeat them, but perhaps with a different viewpoint, because I think everybody has a different viewpoint. Sure. Everybody has a right to have a viewpoint and uh, a different interpretation. I'm for you because I had the privilege of knowing Miyadi and of visiting her many, many times in her small, can you hear me? This, the mic is snapping. And if, if he had uh, visiting her in a very small uh, place in Pontopukur Lane, which is right in the heart of Calcutta, 
And I also went out to Narendra Pur, where her lifelong companion, uh, he had, he ran a school, he had a house. Narendra Pur at that time was just 30 kilometers, now probably it's absorbed into Calcutta. It was a village. And Nirvan Sen Gupta used to have children across, little children, and he was uh, children from age six right up to 16, who would follow him through the village lane, which was really a dusty village at that time. And, and uh, so he would teach them. And this is where Miradi did her bronze casting. I think the title, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's involved. I've had very little to do with the book, except to contribute one paper, which is on the Buddha, which Dr. Lechner has also mentioned, and her journey through the Himalayas, and her transformation, I would say, in the last two or three years of her life. Um, I knew we that the very well. We never spoke of religion. And I'm speaking extra poor because I think uh, uh, she said to me once, my work is my religion. And it really was. I mean, I, I've never, uh, I, I think the title of the book is extraordinary because it says purity of vision. And there it is. She's probably, she was a pure artist. That's what she was. That purity about her, uh, the single-mindedness about her work was extraordinary. Um, I think Dr. Lechner Georg has mentioned that she lived, I think, a very precarious life. And uh, the same little gas stove, not a gas stove, but a little stove that lit the meals that she made, the delicious rice and puisag, and the puisag grew on the walls, on her wall. Um, that was a sort of food which she produced a fantastic meal. And that was, you know, the same stove was used to melt the wax that <laughs> would make a little stove like this, would to melt the wax. I've seen it being done. And then with these wax, that would become threads. It's a lost wax process, which is the most traditional Indian technique that goes back actually to the Indus Valley. And it is continued among the Adivasis in Bastar, which is where she went to learn the technique. Now, this is a fantastic fact. Imagine that you, she went to Germany at the Art Academy in Munich in 1953. And when she came back, she says, she says, she told me, my professor, one of my professors, said to me, it's good that you're looking at Western art, but you must go back to your own tradition. You have a very deep and rich tradition. Don't forget it. And this is quoted in my book. So she came back. Yes, I think there's a lot of expressionism in her. I think particularly the work of Kirchner, uh, uh, and you mentioned Emil Nolde, you mentioned others, but I, I, and I, I think that some expression, but I think there's something very interesting as we were talking and I was thinking, that, um, like them perhaps, but. She expresses pain, she expresses joy, she expresses ecstasy, yes, with the bowel cigar, the dancing cigars, whirling themselves. But it's through the body. That, I think, is a very Indian thing. There is no expression in the face. The faces are, uh, many times, you would say, archetypal. She would identify with the craftsman she worked with. She didn't think of herself as being, as many artists do, uh, as a different category. 
there was no category there. And I will quote her on that, how she worked with them. When she came back, she told me that she saw a dhokra, which was called dhokra, uh, a kind of a nickname, uh, of a, the bronze horse. And she said the moment she saw it, she was transformed. And there was a grant from the Anthropological Survey of India, which took her, which allowed her to spend two years, I think, in Bastar. And there she learned the technique. Her first book was called Mental Craftsman of India, when she went to very many places and learned <coughs> different, uh, you know, but mainly the, the lost wax process. And I think Mira, to spend two years, I mean, we were talking about Bastar in the 50s. It was a different place, and not Bastar today. And she is, it was, as I told you, she lived a life of privation, and she didn't seem to care. I just have one other story to start with, which I seem to have skipped. And that is the fact that in 1976, I had known her now for two years. I bought my one and only Mira Mukherjee, and I no longer have it, unlike Georg. It's a flying horse, and it's probably the finest piece of sculpture that she made of a non-human figure. Uh, and, and of, in fact, I, I, when you see, um, it lay on my bed for something like 20 years, and it kept me company. But it was a horse that you saw going through the skies. Now, she was not interested in mythology. And I come back to my point and reiterate, we never spoke about religion. I do not think that she was religious in the way that you would consider religion as ritual or you would consider her devotion, as she said, my work, she said it to me, my work is my religion. And she was very much a socialist. She was very much, <coughs> not a communist, but yes, a socialist. <laughs> when she came back from Bastar, her work continued to use, I mentioned the lost wax process, which is called in French the Serpetio, it's given the, that technical name, the lost wax. Um, it is threads of wax, threads of wax which you would want. I, I think I should explain it, though I see there are several artists and curators and, and Vinay Jain, who I haven't mentioned, who is sitting, who designed the, this wonderful book, has also gave total commitment. I, I think that the lost wax process is a process that is very laborious, because you make long threads of wax, and you put them round a middle mold. So she's building the sculpture. Then it's covered again by another mixture of <coughs> earth and clay and different things, and it becomes a kind of shape this form. Then it is put into the furnace, and she used the old technique of not, you know, there are many ways, for example, of making ceramics. But, and very high, but she would use the old technique, which would sometimes take three days. And of course, there was a difference between her work and the work that she was inspired by, the, 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 the Karwa, Karwa image makers. Um, their works, and we're talking about Bassar at that time, was something like six inches or ten inches. They were small. Her work, when she was really being ambitious, went from six foot to ten feet to finally the Buddha, which is fourteen feet. So I, I, I think that, you know, that required perhaps, I would say, a different, uh, not furnaces that are stoked all the time, and over three days. And so, she spent all her money on her sculpture, as Dr. Lechner has mentioned. Everything that came in went back into metal. And that is something that has been mentioned. Uh, 
I would like to mention why, to me, Miradi became unique. She was unlike, I think you mentioned that she, I didn't know this, that she was a good friend, but unlike her contemporary sculptors in India, um, I like Pilu Poch Khanavala, whom you mentioned as a friend, and Adi Davyarwala and Amarnath Sehgal. These are, the, are great sculptors, and there were many others, Roy Chodhri, in the 60s. Uh, her work did not incline towards the Western, although she was there. She was there, and she learned the technique, but she did, completely went. Uh, it may have had the soul or the, you know, the feeling. But she had absorbed the world view of the tribals of the other races. And that was very important for her. Um, so I think if I were to, she realized that the difference between contemporary art and people like Adivasi art was not only the size, but the fact that it had to have total relevance to the day. So her involvement, I see her work divided into three categories, really. If you want to do that kind of boring thing, then I would say that her work would go into the category of uh, the first, the, the people involved in their everyday, whether it is fishermen casting their nets, and they themselves are, are the fish. The nets have caught them in it. So it's it's very metaphorical. She might be talking about fishermen, but they are trapped into an existence. It's a Maya. So I think we have to read her work on not realism, but as as yeah, I would say symbolic. There was something that took took you beyond the immediateness of people queuing for milk at a booth, or people queuing, or a bus full of people, people falling out on the top of the bus. I remember these images. Or, you know, other images that would take her completely um, into the lives and of the people around her. That was one kind. The other kind was the single figures, the figures whom she valorized, and they were ordinary people. Now, this is where she absorbed the worldview of the tribals, because Jaidev Baghel, whom I met, who was a great uh, Bastard artist, he said, we don't worship gods. We actually worship human beings, and we, they become heroes for us, or women. Lakhandeo, who was a woodcutter, or somebody, you know, I, I remember Lakhandeo. But women who have done brave things, they become their gods and goddesses, or they did. A lot of Bastard artists change. Now you will have the Shiva iconography, and you probably will have Ram there, but they were not there before. So that is the kind of thing that she absorbed. She took what was the heroism of every her work, which is in the National Gallery of Modern Art, is five feet six, mm -hmm. and it's a woman holding a winnowing, you know, thing that you throw for, for throwing up rice and cleaning it. And it's called the spirit of daily work. That's in the National Gallery. It's a remarkable work. So, and there's this woman who's striding. She had more, little more than most uh, heights of women. But she's there. That's the second category, the single figure and the heroism of that figure. And the third that I'm really going to focus on in my talk is actually the question of when does a work become it moving into the spiritual? When does it get to be, have a, a dimension? I, I don't like that word spiritual, but for want of a better word, when does it have not just feeling of the everyday, but it lifts you above. I think my flying horse had that. She told me, I saw the fly horse flying through the clouds. I saw him flying, and so I made him. So there was always that element of her 
that she could lift something into something else. Dr. Lechner has mentioned that her Buddha, and I, I had also written about this in this book that has just been released by Akar Prakar and by the Raza Foundation and by Dr. Lechner. The, the Buddha was the time we got to know her best. And she wrote to me, I wrote to Amiga the I got one of her postcards and I said, I'm really sorry, I was in Calcutta for six days and involved in a seminar and I didn't come and see you. And she sent me back a postcard saying, it doesn't matter, I wasn't there anyway in my house. I was in in the pool casting. So you wouldn't have found me there because she didn't have a phone. This was before the mobiles, so it was 98. And so this postcard came. She only wrote postcards. And this postcard came the day after she died. So she, there must have been, I must have been one of the last people she sent one of her postcards to because I knew about her death before the postcard reached me. And then Nirmal Babu, Nirmal Sengupta, I wrote to him, and he said, you know, we don't know what to do. She also said something else. She said, I've been so tired. I am so tired. But, and her last image of the Buddha was cast in 64 parts. 64 pieces that we joined together. But she said, but the head is done. And when the head is done, I know my work is done. And that's what she written to me in this. It was not, a, this one it was not a postcard, it was an inland letter, you know, scrawling handwriting. So this left me with the task, because Nirmal Das said, the workers have to be paid. How are we going to pay them? Because she's gone, just overnight like that. And I wasn't a middleman, but I did help to locate a buyer, a buyer who was secretly a Buddhist, and he was an Englishman. I didn't know. I didn't know him personally. But I approached him, and when he came to Calcutta to Kutrik, he went to see this image, this huge, they finally put it together. And he was so mesmerized by the Buddha that he said, we're going to buy it. But he also had a vision. He said this image, 14 feet high, difficult to take it, except by boat, has to stay in this country. And so he, um, he was the head of all the tea estates that not just Goodrick, but a larger tea company owned. So he saw to it that the Buddha was transported up to the Himalayas and that it rested finally in a little town called Badangtang. And in Badangtang, it's a tea estate, like Goodrick should be, and uh, the tea pickers, 20% of that time, or maybe 25%, were Buddhist. So this Buddha came to them. This, there is a monastery, the Ghom Monastery, that is near there. Some of you may have visited the Ghom Monastery. But the Buddha was installed among them. And, you know, this, I think, the fact that she chose that moment when the Buddha is most vulnerable. He is most vulnerable because he's at his moment of realizing, of overcoming Maya and touching Bhumi, Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. And I looked at my collection of Buddhas, three, all of the ones I have, but this Cambodian one, oh, they, except for the Sarnath head, they all are in that position of the right hand reaching down to call the earth as witness. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing that she, he, she chose that moment when he's mortal. Her godlike beings were mortals. They were not, they were superhuman. Like even her kite seller is a superhuman or a boatman who's rowing people across the river 
or an archer, they are beyond the everyday business. But yes, they belong to the everyday. But when she comes to her putha, she actually takes you into a point where she's saying that the Buddha, as we know, was probably a historic human being. And she brings him back to the fact that he is absolutely, he's large, he's buff, he's robust. As Georg mentions, his eyes are open, they're not closed in meditation. They're looking at the world, they're looking now at the Himalayas, at the Kanchenjunga. <coughs> and so I end with that with her. But meanwhile, I bring you, my focus is on the Shoka at Kalinga. And I found in the book that the Lats have also one of the Ashokas, which I, which is mentioned in the book, which is a beautiful one. And so I brought it in. And she says that her image of Buddha evolved on a cigarette packet. I don't think Miradi smoked, but somebody must have smoked. The cigarette packet was there. And she made the sketch on the cigarette packet. And from that sketch, she created it. So, you know, that, and I'm sorry, that was a shoka. And the Buddha image, I can show you the drawing that she did. Quite extraordinary, the way she would do it. But let's get on with the slides, because I think we are really running out of time. And so, what I wanted to end with is that I once asked Minali to write a book. And she said, but Kithi, I'm not going to write the book. You should be writing the book. I'm an artist, you're the, you're the writer. So that really made me think. I mean, I'd like to know how many artists today, many people today, I see Jatin Das sitting there, and he's of the old guard. And you know, people who, who, I'd like to know how many people of the present generation do not have to spend their time on public relations. She couldn't give a damn. It didn't matter to her. How she lived, she survived. That was the important thing. And, 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 and her work was important. Shall we start with the images of Shuru Karenka? Yeah. And it's a very pensive, but I think a very true portrait of her in the years that I knew her. As you can say, she's, she was a very attractive woman, a very sensuous woman. Um, but she didn't care about the way she looked. This is Mira working on her, on her sculpture, and uh, you can see that she's firing, um, making the wax, and it's a group thing. And this is Mira Lee working on the earth carrier, or the, the, the cable workers actually it was called, and uh, first it was called earth carriers. But then it was, I, as far as I remember, it was called cable workers. And you can see the dimension. Um, next I mentioned the fact that there was a man and a woman carrying big bowls of mitti. This is the size, the scale on which she conceived this. And I did see this exhibited in Bombay in the East-West Encounter, as you mentioned. Um, please note the importance of the figure, the fact that the knees almost buckle, because she said sometimes they could, this was the only way she could create it. Um, like an artist, an artisan, an artist must learn to work with us. He's, I think you mentioned this. He must, in fact, work harder. Because while the work of the artisan has its well-defined contours, the universe of the artist is without palpable bounds. In it, he is faced like an explorer with new regions of experience. The solutions are not given by stereotypes. The solutions he will have to find by his own struggle with ideas, materials, and tools. And this word for is very important. For the artist, it will be a ceaseless lifelong struggle. So, she's talking about these people 
and I think this quote has come from Dr. Lechner. I, it's amazing that we pick the same kind of uh, things. Can we artists, modern artists, not approach the work that we do in the same spirit? What if we build a figure not of a god, but of more earthly things? So now I'm quoting from Jaitev Baghel, and he says, the devas and devas we create are many. Some are worshipped for so long that their legends have been forgotten. All of them were born to villagers but were distinctly different from other children. Always they dared and lived to fulfill a need in their society, even at the cost of surrendering their very lives. So this is a Bastard image that I had. I had got it one day vanished. Actually, somebody stole it. But it was large. It was a large piece. And I would like you to note the striations, the, the wax process that he has left in there. And we will see that with Mira's work, also, this is the piece that York ended with, which is in his collection, and she'd call it Thought Streams. So you'll see that she is using the same technique of the striations of the wax, and then she is um, creating a, this image. Uh, and this is a, I think it's got a kind of expressionism which is very Germanic, the way the head juts forward, thinking, but done in the, in the Alibasi technique. This is her, I call it the cube, but in fact it's women carrying water. So this is so the same idea that I mentioned before, of people being enmeshed mm -hmm. into their work, into their yeah. work, into their yeah. existence. And this is the archetypal boatsman. Um, and I mean, a piece that was this big and larger than life. So, this is a wonderful work that I saw with her. And I'm going to go a little slow here. This is the one called The Spirit of Daily Work, which is in fact in the National Gallery of Modern Art and it can be seen. Um, it is really remarkable because she's got an archetypal woman. But look at the way the feet are standing. They're buckling over and they're, <laughs> they're very archaic. And what is she doing with her life? She's just threshing rice. But it is important. And if you look at what I'm suggesting, the face is archetypal of a babu, but the stride of the woman is important, the way she strides, or strives. I just wanted to make point out with one drawing that Mira could do portrait sketches. And this is from the book. And let's go from the drawing to something that she left untitled. What a remarkable head. Mother Earth, she called it. Earth, because the other side of the, the other side of the figure is the forest and the trees and the earth. So it's the earth mother in a sense, it's the head. Really wonderful work, but you see what I mean about the fact that it's an archetypal face, but really breathing and palpable. Really extraordinary the way she does it. I also wanted to point out that like the Buster um, <coughs> craftsman, she did flat images. And this is houses for shelter. Because I think in the last image, actually the other side of this head, if I remember, is a storm. And it's, it's not just nature, but it, the fact that nature can be violent. And that she's also concerned with. The second category of her work, which I mentioned, was a single one. But I forgot to mention the fact that Mira herself sang. And she went into ecstasy when she sang. So uh, our most wonderful images 
are these images of musicians straining of a whole night canopy of stars and people dancing. I mean, that she again imbibed the worldview of the Vastas, of, of people in harmony with nature. And I come back to this cosmic dancer, but it's not the cosmic dancer. She said, my bowels. So the, I, I mean, I, I saw that she said in Shantini Ketan, um, she was taught, the bowels, of course, you know, were uh, all around Shantini Ketan, and she was there. She was there for a full year. So we've forgotten to mention the fact that she was also trained in Shantini Ketan. And she was taught by her teacher that you draw as long as the bowel is dancing. The moment he stops, you stop. It's just an exercise. But she learned from it. So, you, you know, I think there's a tremendous relation, as Lecter mentioned, and it's extraordinary, our thought streams are going the same way. That it is from the bowel, whirling in, in self into ecstasy, that she thought of her Shiva. This is another one which is in black and white, which shows us how she kept the lost wax process. She didn't blur it. You could blur it out. But no, she wanted to show Absolutely. that it was raw. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is an important part of her technique. And here is the flying horse, which was in my collection, which was about three feet in size. And this is in the Lat collection. I don't know how big it is, Rina. It's tiny. Yes. Tiny. But yeah. she talks about the fact that Ashoka was my hero of all heroes, the one who realized that he had created havoc and he repented. But here he's actually rising about the dead bodies, which I think is so extraordinary, the entangled bodies. It's so expressive. And he's already reached that moment of realization. This is a, a thing, uh, I thought of as a subject, a strong person, a hero in fact, but not only a hero. I first made a sketch of the person I had in mind. It was drawn on an used empty cigarette packet. Yet in this little sketch, the hero to be was recognized. Who is a greater hero than the conqueror, who after winning a glorious victory, perceived the horror and devastation it had wrought? and renounce the pursuit of conquest by war. So this is Ashoka at Kalinga. I think Georg showed us, when I went to meet Mira, when I used to go and meet her, this Ashoka used to stand in her little courtyard down below in Pondopukur Lane. And it was stored away. One day it was taken by an actress. Then she didn't want it anymore. A very celebrated actress. I won't tell you who she is. And then it was brought back. Then it stood there again. And I think, in a way, I helped because I spoke to Ashok Chatterjee, who was head of ITDC. And it got through somehow. Somebody said they spoke to Krishan Khanna, but it was finally bought by ITDC Hotel. ITC. Yeah. Not ITDC. ITC. And then, so there it is in front of the Mori. I think a much better place outside, reader than the way they put it now inside, exactly. which is completely, yeah. it yeah, right. loses. Here it has a towering yeah. presence, it shows you how tall it is. Yeah. Yeah. And as Georg mentioned, one hand still holds a sword, yeah. and the other one has gone limp yeah. with realization. <laughs> and the way he looks, oh, it's tremendous. That face so we're crazy. talking about the spiritual. She was asked to make, she told me once, that the very first image she made, to earn a little money was to a Durga actually. <laughs> and I'm wondering, it's a very crude image. If this may not be that image, I don't know. Because it's not got the feeling, it's got power. But so much her heart's not in it. I, I feel, you know, okay, it's all right. Uh, I don't think she had the power 
there, but she talks about the fact that you cannot follow rigidly the iconography. And one has to follow these rules in a creative spirit. And we're going to end with Shiva and the Nataraj. And I bring you to her early images and then to the Cosmic Dancer, which is in the collection of Ruby Pal Chodhri, as far as I know, in Calcutta. And what is extraordinary about this image is the fact that the mandala is twisted out of shape, his hair's flying, <coughs> as you would find in the image of uh, the Nataraj. But the mandala is twisted out of shape. And instead of having two feet and four arms, he has three feet. Yeah. Three feet. So if I like doing it, you can see the three feet here. One is reaching up to the mandala that's twisted out of shape. So two are on the ground. So it's uh, wonderful. I mean, just to balance the sculpture, to create a new kind of sculpture. His mind and his eye tell him at times to be his own guide. He can then make inspired departures from what are generally believed to be infallible rules. To create an image uniquely his own, though not violating tradition. I think this is a very important point, the way she interprets an image. So this is another image, another version of the same, and you can see the leg grasping out here. The last of the images I take up, and I'm very happy to say that all three of them are in India, the large ones, um, including the Ashoka at Kalinga, which is at the ITC, and now the Buddha, which I followed quite closely. And she gave me this book, by the way, the last time I met her. And it was like, you know, I don't know, later it's what about it, it was like a parting gift. She put everything she wanted into this. And she talked about these monasteries. That, and remind you, she went there when she was over 65. She went by bus and by road to these monasteries. They're not easy to find, Dabo. And this was the sketch that she made of the Buddha. Extraordinary. Just so free. And the hand touching down is very important. Note the proportion of the head to the body. It's completely unlike what you would expect. And the body, as I mentioned before, is really very important. It's the body that's important. And in the Buddha himself, this is, by the way, when they brought him to the Kudrick house in Calcutta. And he was lit up and people would come and see. You can see the Kudrick building in the background. Again, the head looking up, just like the Ashoka, is looking beyond. It's looking beyond the image. And the very long arm, if you see it, is kind of dis disproportionate. The long arm reaching down to touch the earth, Bhumi Sparsha. And in his left hand, there is actually a tablet. I'm sorry, I don't can't remember what it says, but I think it quotes from the Buddha. And this is when the Buddha is being transported from the Godric house in Calcutta. And you can see the scale, 14 feet, and the people are half the size. Imagine this was the one that was cast in 64 parts and had to be welded together after she went. And this is the Buddha now installed in Bhadrantham. So it's a really wonderful, wonderful um, tribute that he... And she's looking out to Kanchanjaga, he's looking over the Himalayas. I think Gordon Fox picked a remarkable tea estate to place him. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Misha would be very happy. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Don't go away yet. There's still some more. And you'd miss it if you left. So I'm not going to give my vote of thanks because everybody will run out of patience. But there's one person I want to thank who's here, and this Ishani. She's from the ITC. And she helped me to get the permissions to get the photograph of the book, the one which is on the cover of Ashoka. And I'm very grateful to her for this. Thank you. Uh, I have acknowledged ITC in the book, but they didn't want to be a partner to the book, but, so never mind. Uh, so the film that we've been waiting for, it's a Films Division's film made in 1981. It took us about six months to get it transferred to a CD. And several, you know, the machine was out of order, we had to install parts to get this film here to you. So it's just a 15 minute film, do have a look. Thank you.
so much for staying back for the film. We really worked hard to try and get it. Sorry, the sound was not so good. Uh, quick word of thanks to GPV, to Jörg Leshner, to all of you for being here, uh, to all our partners, uh, Raja Foundation, of course, uh, Imami Art, Mapin, and my team, which worked so hard to put this book together. It took us almost eight years to bring it to what you see it today. Um, the contributors to the book, there are nine contributors who have written for the book. Uh, not going to take the names now, it's going to take very long. And of course, to uh, all the collectors who went out of their way to help us get the images of the works and give us permissions for that. There's another way, there are two very important people here. One is uh, Vinay Jain. Are you still here? Uh, he's left. Okay, Vinay was instrumental in uh, the design of the book. He's removed his name from there because he says, I don't put my name <laughs> anonymous. But yes, he's done the wonderful design. And there's Yukti, who is uh, the family of Meera Mukherjee. And uh, thank you for all the support and the copyrights and everything that we could put together. Yeah, and thank, thank you, all of you, for staying back and being so patient. And the book is available outside. Uh, we have a special price for it for today for 2,000 rupees. Otherwise, it's for 2,950. So you could book your copy today and you'll get the special price. Thank you. Yeah,